My name is Jeanette Gare. I'm the director of a nonprofit called Environment Georgia. And y'all are in the, what are we calling this? City and Community Leadership on Clean Energy. I am really excited about this panel. This is a cool panel to have after lunch because number one, everyone on this panel has a really great story to tell of how we are actually moving the needle right now in Georgia on dealing with our climate pollution problems. And then number two, this panel, I'll let this come out, but this panel also has a really cool story to tell when it comes to um, the election day. Maybe some people didn't, might not even know that we had an election on, on Tuesday. People vote, hopefully you did. Um, but I would say that the people on this panel are probably some of the biggest climate winners coming out of that election day. So we've got a really cool story to tell about election day. Um, my organization, Environment Georgia, we're a nonprofit. We work statewide on clean air, clean water, green spaces. That's our tagline. And our primary strategies for making those things happen are research, organizing, and advocacy. So I'm a lobbyist um, down at the state capitol. Um, but then we also do a lot of work uh, very locally, which is why I got to pull this panel together. Because sometimes, let's face it, you can't make things happen at the federal level. Maybe it's hard to make things happen at the statewide level. But you can make really cool things happen at the city level. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So I, this panel could also be called, instead of being called the City and Community Leadership on Clean Energy, could also be called the 100% panel. Um, one of the things that Environment Georgia is really focused on is how can we move our country towards a future where we get 100% of our energy from clean and renewable sources. And pretty much everyone on this panel um, is in some, you know, phase of making that happen. And the really interesting thing is they're in all different phases. So we're going to hear about a, a bunch of different um, steps along the way of actually transitioning to 100% clean and renewable energy. Um, the reason we work on 100% clean energy is because, well, number one, we have to. <laughs> um, if we are going to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, if we're gonna hit our Paris Climate Accord goals, science basically says we're gonna to have to make that transition happen. Um, the other reason is I think it avoids some of the um, partisanship that automatically comes into play when you start talking about climate change. If you just say 100% clean energy, it's amazing how great that polls. I think some of it is because it gives something, people really clear things to, to imagine and picture. Some of it is it doesn't have the climate change word even in you know, the title. So those are some of the reasons that we at Environment Georgia have really latched on to this 100% campaign and are, are pushing it in a bunch of different places. Um, I wanted to kick this panel off with a couple of numbers. Um, and then um, hand it off to our panelists. But first I will, well, so let me do the numbers first and then I'll introduce our panelists. So um, the numbers, I think we have some good news. So Env Environment Georgia, part of a national network, that national network, Environment America, puts out a report every year that called Renewables on the Rise. Um, and it tracks our progress. So for example, since 2009, we have um, more than, 40 times more solar panel in the country. We have tripled our wind power. So combined solar and wind right now are powering over 35 million homes. Um, we have 361,000 electric vehicles on the road today. Um, in 2009, we basically had zero. And then we have an 18-fold increase in uh, battery storage. So we are going in the right direction in a lot of places. Unfortunately, in Georgia, um, less than 5% of our energy mix, electricity mix, is coming from renewables. So the people on this panel are working to fix that day in, day out. Another piece of why cities is if you just look at like what percentage um, uh, of our energy use in Georgia cities use. So we use about 130, 135 million megawatt hours of electricity in Georgia every single year. On this panel, between Atlanta, Savannah, and Athens, um, we've got a little less than 10% of that energy use represented. So we are en big energy users right here on the stage, energy hogs, figuring things out. Um, so that's why this is important. Now onto our panelists. 
Um, so first, sitting right here, we have David Eady, who works actually during his day job. I don't know which one you would call your day job, David. Um, <laughs> actually with Racy Anderson Center for Sustainable Business and has been working on the Drawdown Project already. So when I called him and asked him to be on this panel, he was excited and knew what I was asking for. Um, but um, maybe in his other day job, he is the just elected mayor of Oxford, Georgia. Congratulations. We also have Tim Denson, who is a city council member, actually, I guess a commissioner for Athen in Athens, Clark County. Um, he has a long um, history of a, being an organizer and an advocate in Athens um, and Clark County. Um, but then before that, did a lot of camping as a traveling musician. <laughs> um, and then next to him, we have Nick Defley, who's the director of the Savannah Office of Sustain Sustainability, who comes to us by way of the Twin Cities. I did not know that about you until um, I got ready to introduce you. And then, fun fact about Tim is he has just recently um, perfected the art of kimchi making. So if you're interested, you can ask about that in the question and answer session. And then last, we have Shelby Busso, um, who is the brand new City of Atlanta um, Chief Sustainability Director. Um, yeah. Congratulations, Shelby. Shelby will be spending the weekend in a yurt at Fort Yargo State Park. <laughs> um, so fun facts about our panel. And then again, these guys have really cool examples of moving the needle um, here in Georgia. So handing it off to David. OK. So yeah, I think we all decided we needed to be able to cheat a little bit and uh, look at our slides there. So uh, just to let you know, Bottom line up front, I'm going to talk about our city um, moving to remove the standby capacity charges that are being that were being charged on distributed generation uh, as a DG rider in our um, electric rates. And uh, so, I just want to give you the sort of the bottom line up front. But really, before I got started, I wanted to make a, a few points here. The in our campaign to remove this what we considered a discriminatory tax on distributed generation or DG technologies in our city, there are a few key considerations. Uh, first of all, our city is um, very much in favor of sustainability and embraces that concept and would support uh, any number of the sustainable development goals that you may see up here. And um, so, you know, going into a conversation about whether we are incentivizing or disincentivizing deployment of renewable uh, technologies is, uh, comes into play there. Our, another um, consideration was that our city lead leaders, that is the mayor and city council, um, we decided several years ago that we wouldn't buy into the new nuclear power units that were being contemplated at that time. So um, I think we're the only MEAG power member city that did not uh, sign up for that. So that helped our um, debt situation as the cost of that continues, um, which is a good thing for us. Um, and so Oxford is in a really good financial position with a strong forecast for continued financial sustainability. Um, and in fact, MEAG Power projects that our product, energy production or electric production costs are going to go down by about 10% over the next 10 years. So that was another thing good for us in talking about uh, the potential of losing revenue uh, from our electric customers. But, um, you know, as we consider policies and initiatives that mitigate um, climate change and uh, enable investments in, um, in ways that will reduce energy costs, we have to also address social equity. Um, you know, we have to understand and address the fact that our neighbors with lower incomes, who are often disproportionately people of color, have a higher energy burden than uh, those neighbors with higher incomes. And uh, those neighbors with lower incomes have less access to funding, either from personal finances or third party financing, to make investments that would reduce their energy burden. So therefore, it'd be disingenuous to advocate for and pursue policy changes that remove barriers and enable investment in technologies and strategies that reduce energy costs and reduce carbon footprints if we do nothing to ensure our neighbors with lower incomes can access these technologies and strategies. So I just want to start with that to give you uh, sort of my own personal starting point and the basis for a lot of conversations we've been having in our community. Um, 
just real quickly, a few things. This is uh, to represent our, our fiscal situation. We have a, uh, we've been on average um, having a surplus on our electric utility revenue of around $600,000 um, a year. And on our, but on our general fund, which typically is fueled by property taxes and sales taxes, we've had a running deficit on average over the last 13 years of just over $200,000. So we, like a lot of municipalities, are in this similar situation. It's not unusual. And so what we do is we depend on the revenue from our, our enterprise funds, like um, electric utility uh, fees, as well as our water and sewer fees, to help make up that, that shortfall. <laughs> what was interesting is when we started talking about, and I first started raising back in 2016, the fact that we had adopted this DG rider uh, that imposed a standby capacity charge that uh, started getting some pushback from the Electric Cities of Georgia, which provides the technical assistance to cities that are part of MEAG, like ours. And so these are, these are points that are made on slides that they presented to our council, um, which I found kind of interesting, such as saying that uh, if we allow DG customers, then we won't be able to sufficiently cover the fixed cost of our electric utility. And then in fact, we're going to be pushing the burden of paying for those fixed costs onto the non-DG customers. <clears throat> and so the, the reason for having a standby capacity charge was to ensure that DG customers pay their appropriate share of the fixed cost, which I responded with this and saying, you know, we all pay the blue line, which is the base fee of $15 a month. So we're all paying the same. So does appropriate mean equal? We're paying an equal fixed rate. But we actually make up the, uh, you know, the bulk of our costs through the variable rate that everyone pays, the per kilowatt hour rate. But the reality of, of life here is that we're all over the map. The one on the far left is my house. And you know my neighbor, I grew up on Bonnell Street, which is kind of in the middle there. And so I guess you could argue that I'm paying a lot more of my share of the uh, cost for our city, but that's really bogus. What is we're, our rates set up to where those who use more pay more. And you know, looking at the sort of per uh, kilowatt hour cost, you know, that's reflected. It also depends on when you're using it. So how much you use, when you use it, it affects how much you're paying. And so to me, that seemed like a, a much more um, appropriate structure and so, um, you know, we, why do we want to change that and suggest that suddenly people who want to make an investment in energy conservation or uh, through DG technologies like solar roofs are going to suddenly get penalized? Um, so these were questions I raised to, uh, in, to our council and, you know, brought up to the uh, ECG folks and, you know, making the point that so for a typical, say, a five kilowatt uh, solar system on your house, you're going to end up paying $15,000 or so to put that on your house. You get a 30% income credit, so it comes out netting out to be about uh, just over $10,000. So if you did that, though, you would, in our city, we had an $11.15 uh, per kilowatt capa of your nameplate capacity charge per month, so I, that five kilowatt system was going to cost me $55 or more, more than $55 a month um, that I was going to have to pay out that's going to erode my savings that I'm getting on my electric bill. And I said, well, if I took $10,000 and I put it into uh, re-insulating my home, I have an old house, that'd be probably a good thing, and replaced all my single pane, old single pane windows with double pane windows or triple pane windows, I might actually achieve the same level of energy savings, 30% or so, um, that way, but I don't get taxed. So this is clearly a discriminatory tax that is targeting a specific class of technologies because of a concern of a loss of uh, demand for generate, electric generating capacity and a loss for the city of revenue. <laughs> but it was interesting that, that uh, folks want to keep talking about like that it was a cost for customers to put solar panels on their house, a cost to the city, and that so we needed this, this charge to recoup costs. I'm like, where's the cost? Um, and what it came down to was they were saying the, the number we ga gave ECG that we needed in, in surplus revenue uh, that they would plug into calculating our rate was uh, um, 
what they were considering a cost. And I was like, no, that's just lost revenue or less revenue we're going to get, but it's not a cost. Um, so just even the, the conversation around semantics was just an interesting one um, that we had. And uh, fortunately, um, you know, by showing that there really wasn't a, a cost basis for these discriminatory fees, um, but they were more focused on revenue and then pointing out the fact that if everybody in our city put uh, solar panels on their house, then we would probably lose around $200,000 in revenue, and that wouldn't be the end of the world, given that we have a, uh, such a significant surplus. Um, and then also, you know, pointing out the fact that uh, the reality is that probably less than 10, and turned out to be about five, I think. Uh, Sarah, you could probably check me on that. Uh, folks put those, uh, put solar panels on their house, so we really only are losing around 2,000 or $2,500 a year in revenue. So it's like, what's the big deal, right? So in pointing out the property tax or the property rights issue of discriminatory uh, taxes on people who want to make investments in their home to save energy costs and uh, making the point that there really was no cost basis, we were successful after two rounds of voting and lots and lots of uh, conversations um, able to get the council to pass uh, with one, one negative vote um, to remove the standby capacity charges. So I'll stop with that. Good afternoon, everybody. You're not asleep yet, all right? <laughs> all right. Uh, so I'm Nick Defley. I'm the director of sustainability at the city of Savannah. I've uh, been there since 2014, which is where we started the department. Um, I picked out this picture because it's not one you usually see of Savannah as regularly. Usually we give our candy shots of like looking back downtown from the river. We show all the, the gold leaf dome and all that stuff. But this is just going down the river with the Savannah slash Talmadge Bridge back there and the port behind that and just obviously the, the waterway is a big component of uh, our lives in Savannah and just being a low-lying coastal community. So um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit is, you know, we're going to give some stages here from different, different municipalities around the state where we are in the conversation around clean energy and, and moving towards clean energy as perhaps a county or municipal resolution and then putting in the, the real grunt work to make that happen. And all the policies and things we need to think about as we go through that. So um, we as in Savannah are not yet to a point where we're, we have a council resolution or anything else that says we are 100% clean energy and moving towards that. But the conversation has started and that is why I'm here is just to really exclaim that from the, the mountaintops and let folks know that we, if you had asked me even a year ago, I would not have thought that that would be happening. Uh, so things are changing very, very quickly on the political and policy front around this as well, around the state. Um, one thing I will mention, too, is that Savannah just, you know, we just had our elections on Tuesday. How's that? Man, you're really new, aren't you? All right. Uh, <clears throat> on Tuesday. And so we had a pretty substantial shift in our elected officials. We got nine council members. They're all up for election at the same time. The mayor is going to a runoff. We had a number of incumbents uh, that are no longer going to be there as of January. And I, I would say either way, I was feeling pretty good with the council and the direction they were headed with this, this whole conversation. But now there's probably even more of a focus, if I have to guess right now, and there's still a lot to read and learn about some of the newer can or incoming elected officials, but probably more looking at that social equity side and that social justice side as we talk about going to clean energy. Um, and I will say one other thing before, I know I keep staring at this slide. Uh, one other thing is that another first for Savannah is this, leading up to this election cycle, we actually had a town hall fully dedicated to a climate conference. So all of the elected officials came in for the first time in Savannah and they had to answer questions about environment and climate change and 100% renewable energy and they got to hear from their constituents that this was something that was a big deal to them and important. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, so what's driving our conversation? Uh, 
resilience for me and for all of the work I do in the community. I can sum it up all in that way. Uh, community health resilience, climate resilience, and economic and equity resilience. So when I talk about community health, that is a main factor and probably my gateway in for any type of conversation I have out in the community about sustainability, about resilience. We are always looking at what are the impacts of environmental issues on key health indicators in our community and especially in our most vulnerable communities. Um, we are looking at how much folks have access, access to all sorts of things, access to active recreation, access to healthy food, access to uh, transportation, and urban connectivity, greenscape space, all of those things play into what we talk about with resilience and they all tie back to 100% clean energy as well. Uh, so the more resilient we can be, the more different ways that we can rely upon our infrastructure to get us where we need to be to provide the services we need, that helps support a more clean energy economy as well. Climate impacts. So Savannah, how many of you are from the coastal part of Georgia? All right, so you all have had this experience in the last four years. We've had four hurricanes and three evacuations, right? Uh, Dorian was our last evacuation. That was the storm that never was in a lot of ways for us, but um, substantial cost, right? Just merely for having people be displaced, be out for a substantial amount of time without making any economic revenue along the way and then having to come back. And then for those who stayed, just having to deal with a lot of their town being shut down. Um, just a real challenge for us. And that is really, I think, been at the heart of a lot of the social awareness and consciousness that's being driven around how can we start talking about different energy sources, how, what is the impact between the energy sources we have now and what we see going on in our climate. So anything from our larger and more frequent storm events to the frequency of hurricanes and inundation, we can all start to use that as our conversation, our gateway into this larger concept. And then finally, um, Equity and economics, and I would say this is the one where I am probably most regularly in conversation in our community. We have in Savannah, uh, one in four folks are living at or below the poverty line. Obviously, that's predominantly African American communities. We are 55% African American. Um, many of those most vulnerable communities are in low-lying areas. Many of those communities have high energy burdens. Many of those communities don't have access to those fundamental services I was talking about with active recreation, transportation, and connectivity, uh, or evacuation plans. Um, and so we are trying to think about how those homes that they're living in that might be dilapidated, that need a lot of weatherization, how the energy burdens that they're already paying when they're already so taxed how we start to even that out when we're talking about 100% clean energy and what does that look like. So that's probably going to be one of the first things we really dig into in Savannah as we look at this 100% clean energy resolution, moving that forward because I think there is substantial possibility for that and I, I'm, it's, I'm speaking it into existence. It will happen. Um, but that will be our biggest cha challenge because everyone will agree it's good, but if we are doubly impacting folks that are already stressed beyond their point then we're not winning this game. Um, so what are we doing right now? And this is what are we doing probably over the last few years, but we have two really cool um, third party kind of certified housing developments that I wanted to point out. One is called Sustainable Fellwood. It's on the west side of town, kind of off of Bay Street. It was one of the first lead pilot neighborhood communities. Uh, it has been very cool. A lot of pieces of that have really worked. They're, you know, low cost to operate, energy efficient ho housing. We did a, s oh, the other housing is uh, Savannah Gardens and it's Earthcraft certified and it's on the other side, the east side of town. So uh, next time you're in Savannah, come and take a look at both of those. Uh, Solarized uh, Tybee slash Savannah, we did that in 2015. So I think that was the first Solarize in the state of Georgia, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, it was also the highest response at the time in the southeast, and I think our response beat out Asheville, North Carolina, which if you know anything about Asheville, that to me is kind of a surprise. I mean, it's, yeah. So um, that was pretty cool. We, we have a Soul Smart designation for the city, just essentially making the code and all that easier for residential to install solar. Uh, the city council in 2017 passed their Savannah Forward Strategic Plan, which includes things like good government and efficient government. So under that are increasing the energy efficiency of our buildings as well as electrification of our fleet. 
We're very proud to finally have a few electric vehicles in our fleet, and we're moving more into that every year. So there's a picture of one of our little Leafs there. Um, we also have a really cool project, Smart Sea Level Sensor Project, that is actually a partnership with Dr. Cobb and Georgia Tech and a big team here. Um, what's really cool about that is it, we are developing a framework and a backbone for sensors of all types. And so we can start, we're measuring sea level now, but we're going to start measuring air quality. We're going to start measuring heat island impact. We're going to start measuring water quality. I mean, the, the, when I say we're going to, that's my dream. That's what we're going to do. Um, but we're moving in that direction. And the reason I say all that is because those are exactly the same things that we need to start bringing into this conversation. So where, where do we not have enough tree canopy? Where is our high energy burden? Where are our, our under weatherized homes? and start piecing that all together to start helping reduce the impact of moving towards clean energy on some of our most vulnerable. But then also, what can we do to start bringing in that workforce and training them and certifying them in a lot of the programs that are going to help make this new economy happen? So with that, I think, oh, you don't need to see that. That's the sea level thing, but that's all I've got. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, Tim Denson, like I said, uh, commissioner with athens Clark County. Um, but w one of the perspectives that uh, I want to be talking about specifically is also um, m uh, my work as community organizer and, and the, the importance of community organizing to actually have an effective um, uh, push uh, to combat climate change and to embrace renewable energy and how a lot of these things are not gonna happen, they definitely are not gonna happen alone just because of elected officials or just because of staff, that community organizing, community engagement part is, is completely necessary. Um, so it kind of started, really ramped up, environmentalism, of course, in Athens has always been there, there's been activism there, but really in the last decade, a little bit longer than a decade, things kind of went to another level, especially uh, on the UGA campus. A lot of it started there. Big push with like uh, Beyond Coal UGA shutting down their coal burning power plant that was there. Uh, bag to bag UGA pushing to get rid of single use plastics. All these groups started popping up and kind of joining some of those older environmental activists and um, getting, getting more mobilized, getting more effective at their advocacy and uh, joining groups like uh, Georgia Climate Change Coalition um, and through all this, kind of put pressure on UGA first, who took a, a step to create uh, their Office of Sustainability back in uh, 2010. Um, but that, that, that pressure kind of leaked out into the entire community, started growing, getting, getting stronger and stronger, and made its way, thankfully, into uh, City Hall in athens Clark County. Uh, took a little bit longer, but that pressure was there, and because of it, there was some moderate investment and, and renewable energy and fighting climate change, uh, some soft commitments that were there. Um, but the first grounded thing that happened here that was really effective was the creation of uh, the Sustainability Office for athens Clark County. Um, and, and that happened in the summer of 2017. And by doing that, uh, we were able to have our, um, our Sustainability Office Director, Andrew Saunders, in there. And we had a, a, an entity in place to actually start putting these visions in, into action and actually start making, uh, making some progress. And uh, through that, we had a, a few small investments, but again, that there just wasn't the uh, expediency that was needed, that was necessary. It wasn't prioritized to the level that it really should be. Um, but that, that, that growing activism did nothing but get larger and larger. Our, our, the advocates who were fighting for these things and other things uh, got more educated, got more effective, uh, built better relationships with elected officials, um, with staff through the county and through UGA. And we started to see some real progress. And that, that made its way into our election cycle in 2018. Um, and like Nick brought up, like the changing uh, environment around policy and elections, there, there really is a big change here. And that really hit Athens pretty hard in 2018 where, uh, including myself, we had uh, five new commissioners come in, five commission seats flip, and the one out of uh, six on the ballot, and the one that didn't flip um, was already kind of focusing on, uh, on renewable energy and sustainability already. And also having a new mayor, uh, Kelly Gertz, come in place too. 
And this was, this really happened though because of that groundswell of grassroots organizing that was happening. Uh, we had also town halls on, on uh, climate change specifically around committing to 100% renewable energy during this election cycle. We had organizations like uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, like Athens for Everyone, um, and uh, the Georgia uh, Climate Change Coalition uh, hold events and also put out questionnaires that they published uh, holding candidates to, to, the, to these issues, wanting to get them in writing where they stood. Are they committed to 100% uh, renewable energy? Are they actually gonna work on it? And then, like I said, putting those things in writing, get them, getting it publicized, getting it in the media so people knew and that those elected officials could be held accountable to those things later on, which is always key. Somebody can always tell you something in private, but get it in writing, especially if they're an elected <laughs> official uh, or a politician in general. Um, and, and so uh, this, this, this groundswell really kind of brought in this new, this new commission that was also uh, by far the youngest and most diverse commission that athens Clark County has ever had. And by having a mayor in place who was willing to prioritize these issues um, and, and to expedite the projects it, it, before this commission that really had a mandate to take these things on, it really changed things um, and sped things up considerably. Uh, again, we had, had, had this office of sustainability there for uh, a couple of years and a little bit of investment, but not a lot happened in place. And it really started to prioritize uh, taking some action, taking a strong stand, and actually getting some, some, uh, some projects uh, actually built. Uh, a, a, a big part of this all came down uh, through a group, though, uh, that, that came out of the, the election cycle, kept on working through the advocacy, and they called themselves 100% Athens. Um, it's a fitting name. Uh, the, the big push, and they, I was very impressed by this whole thing, because they really put in place not just a demand for us to take a commitment to 100% renewable energy. But they, they, they laid out a timeline, a map, and really worked on it with staff, worked on it with elected officials to have this map in place so that this could become a reality. But the first step was there to, to formalize that commitment that many of us had made um, when, when campaigning. And so in May of, of uh, this year, we actually did pass a resolution committing ourselves to 100% renewable energy for county energy use by 2035, and for the entire county by 2050. Um, is that? We had wristbands. Did, oh, you, damn, you no, know, I never noticed those wristbands. Those were pretty awesome, yeah. And fantastic t-shirts and everything. Um, and the, why I was so impressed by this, and this is something that I'm committed to as an organizer, but also like the official, is this resolution, this, this became a reality because of, again, the community members, this grassroots movement, working hand in hand with elected officials, working hand in hand with staff, with uh, healthy relationships, healthy communication happening there. And this resolution was really written by all three of those entities coming together. Uh, and that way we ended up having a, a resolution, I think, that really spoke to the needs and that really works for our community very well. Um, we have a 38% poverty rate in athens Clark County. You take the students out, we still have over 28% poverty rate there. So we had to make sure that we had language in there that spec spoke to the equity issue, made, making sure, which has already been brought up, that we were prioritizing that uh, low-income individuals, communities of color that are, are often more disproportionately affected by energy costs and climate change were going to be prioritized here. This was going to be a, a, a transition that worked for everyone. So we made sure that was in place. And that was honestly the easy part, a bit. Maybe not politically easy, but it was the easy part, just to take a stand, to make a statement. The really difficult part, and this has been difficult for many communities that have taken this step, is how are you gonna pay for it? How are you actually going to do it? And that comes down to, again, just having a, a smart plan in place. And 100% Athens, um, Oh yeah, I'll also jump to this here before we get to that exciting part. Again, just having that expediency um, with having a mayor who supports these things um, and having a commission with a mandate, we have now have eight facilities that have solar power now, uh, producing a, a just under 800 kilowatts. Um, also with having uh, geothermal uh, heating in place, a, a lot of things that are all kind of coming together and finally happening, um, which is really because of that political initiative from the commission. 
Oh yeah, we have really cute sheep that are uh, that groom all of our grass. There, it's hard to mow underneath solar panels, so you just get some sheep, y'all. It's great. <laughs> Central services love it. They don't have to take a lawnmower out there. Um, but the, the way we paid for it, and the way we're going to pay for it, at least starting out, is through SPLOS, which, thank goodness, athens Clark County passed our SPLOS package this past Tuesday, so this is now a reality. We actually now have $15.8 million that we are able to use just for renewable en energy infrastructure. Um, yeah. It's, it, it's a big deal. Right now, we're already, we're already at over 15% uh, uh, renewable energy going, but this is gonna, how we're going to be able to get by 2035 to that 100%. Um, and this is something I want to point out for maybe those communities that aren't uh, quite as liberal, maybe, as athens Clark County. Look at the second line here, the estimated annual operating savings. Annually, we're going to save $1.2 million because of this investment over 10 years. That's going to bring out over $12 million of savings. So we're investing 15.8. We're going to save over $12 million. When you put this in place, whenever people are dealing with SPLOS referendums, one of the, you, they just want to make sure it makes sense. You're t if you tell a more moderate, conservative elected official, like, listen, I know you have your own SPLOS thing you're trying to push through, but there's some operating cost increase there. SPLOS can't pay for that. If you put this place in place, you can bring down your operating costs in that SPLOS referendum. That really gains you some of those more conservative, more moderate votes when you're pushing this through. And I think this is, by doing that, you can really sell using a SPLOS as, as a, a capital funding for um, renewable energy, in, I think, in any county, honestly. When you put that in place, this should really speak to anybody. This really shows that this is a nonpartisan issue. But again, this only happened because of that grassroots support, that, that community organizing behind this writing this, advocating for it, telling their neighbors to vote for it, and to get it in place. So it, uh, I think that's, if I can say one takeaway here, always prioritize those, those community voices, get them engaged, get them part of it. All right. Um this has been very interesting. Thanks, guys. Um, and I'll uh, go ahead and admit that I was maybe a little slide heavy. So sorry about that. Um, Y'all were very efficient with your slides. Um, but anyway, I'm Shelby Busso, and I'm the new Chief Sustainability Officer for the city of Atlanta. Um, I've been on the job for just a few weeks, so a lot of this work that I'm going to reference has actually happened before my time. Um, but we are in the office of One Atlanta. For those of you who haven't heard of that, it's one of the mayor's offices. It encompasses a wide range of topics. Sustainability is one of those. Our mayor definitely leads forward with the equity conversation first. The way that we actually define resilience is sustainability plus equity. Um, so I wanted to just start off by saying, why did Atlanta create a clean energy plan? If you can tell by the evolution of this conversation, Atlanta did. Um, pass a resolution in 2017, and then we have since also passed a plan to achieve this 100% clean energy goal. But I wanted to kind of go back in time um, when I was researching this question, found some of the slides, and I thought it might be helpful to share what motivated um, our decision makers to go ahead and go forward. And none of this will be a surprise, but I am going to put numbers up here. I know some of you all might be climate scientists. Don't judge. These are old. Um, <laughs> But it just helps to show you have to kind of cover all the bases when you're trying to convince lawmakers of any decision that um, they're not familiar with. So the first thing that we looked at was just acknowledging that climate change is happening. We wanted to make sure it was clear, everybody understood what we're talking about, why we're doing this, why the clean energy plan was important. Um, we obviously all here know that the last five years have been the hottest on human record. Um, and we brought it down to distill for Georgia. So why is this important for Georgia? Um, again, we kind of reference those climate impacts, the temperature changes, all of that. Um, we don't have to go too deep into all this, but again, summer heat. Um, if people are acknowledging what their pressure points are, people don't like hot days, they know air conditioning is expensive. Um, so these are, again, just a refresher. Um, for some people, uh, it was the air pollution. So we have brought in the health impacts of clean energy over and over again. Um, the figure I found here was that more than 310,000 people in Georgia are especially vulnerable to extreme heat. So again, talking about our vulnerable populations. And 
what is going to resonate with different uh, council members or administrators? It could be mosquitoes. Who likes mosquitoes? <laughs> Nobody. So if all else fails, too many mosquito days, <laughs> whatever it takes. Um, again, I think uh, Nick was talking about flooding issues um, or coastal resilience issues here in the city. Um, we talk a lot about inland flooding as a concern for a lot of constituents. So this resonated again with many. Um, we reminded folks about the population increase that the Atlanta region will potentially add 2.5 million people by 2040. So we can't ignore the fact that people are coming and um, we're going to at a minimum have to maintain status quo. So quickly, um, climate change is an equity issue. We do have a moral imperative to act on this and we know that the impacts of climate change disproportionately affect those of um, the most vulnerable populations. So then we looked back in time a little bit. Um, what has Atlanta done? Like I said, we um, have a few accomplishments that sort of laid the groundwork, one of which was the Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge. If y'all are familiar with that, we also it's a national commitment to reduce um, private, mostly commercial sector building um, energy and water use by 20% by the year 2020. And Atlanta actually already accomplished this goal two years ahead of schedule with data ending year 2018. We celebrated that last night. Um, and we also have passed a benchmarking ordinance. That was a nice step forward to again, just start a lot of that data gathering that you guys are talking about. Um, we have a sustainable building ordinance that's more cleaning up our own shop, looking inside at Atlanta city buildings, how we can optimize operations internally. And then I'll talk a little bit more about Solar Atlanta. So Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge, what that proved is that we could get private sector buy-in to efficiency measures. We had over 600 buildings participating. Um, it was, I think it was even more than this. This might be an old number of over 114 million square feet of business uh, building space committed. Um, what that translated to was 3.2 trillion BTUs saved. Um, 1.3 billion gallons of water saved and over 119,000 metric tons of CO2 avoided. In dollar signs, again, if that's important um, to the decision makers, there's 5.14 million um, in annual average increased income, 67 jobs every year came out of the Better Buildings Challenge and we saw um, some economic impacts too. We've looked at health impacts. Um, this is just a cool chart. I won't go into all the details, but basically the public health benefits of the Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge, because they're so comprehensive, have really affected the entire Southeast and beyond. All right, so given, given how urgent it is, what can we do? So like I said, in 2017, um, the city of Atlanta pledged to achieve 100% clean energy by 2035. And like I said, lots of slides, sorry. Um, our outreach process for the plan development was extensive. Like others have referenced, it really is important to make sure the community is bought into the process. So there were over 3,500 people engaged. Many partners in the room helped with that outreach. Um, there were a lot of surveys, a lot of questions, a lot of visits at homeowners, a lot of MPU meetings, <laughs> a lot of that. Um, and we decided what we heard from them was at least start with your operations first. Um, as you can see in this chart, municipal operations in the city of Atlanta account for about 7% of the total use in the city. So we know that's not a huge chunk of the pie, but one that we needed to work on because we actually did have some control. You can see some breakout there over what we're talking about when we talk about municipal operations. We have the airport, it's a big one. Um, so we had to start with that and others to make sure that we were walking the walk first. We have an electrical, electric vehicle program. We have over 50 um, deployed in our own city fleet. We actually even have a full-time staff member in our office, um, an EV technical advisor who's working on this, and we passed the most comprehensive EV readiness policy in November of 2017. Like I mentioned, we have the sustainable building ordinance, which actually requires all new municipal buildings over 5,000 square feet to be LEED certified silver. We also um, have added on the, added, the layer of municipal buildings over 25,000 square feet will undergo lead for existing building certification. Um, we are currently still almost finished, but we're working on a performance contract 
uh, program on our municipal operations, we do project this to end up saving us about $10 million in avoided costs. So it should be a successful program just by, again, optimizing what we're already doing. Um, Solar Atlanta, we have more than 20 buildings that are participating in this. We'll have up to 1.25 megawatts of solar. Um, we did use the SEPA program for this so that we have no upfront costs and only expect to see some savings from the Solar Atlanta program. Um, what else? Okay. So we wanted to realize again that, yeah, we can optimize our internal work, but that um, everybody in Atlanta really needs to benefit from this. Equity is top of mind for a reason. As you can see by this, we have mapped out where our energy burden populations are. They're primarily south of I-20 in these hot spots here. Um, so this is really who we're talking about when we want to support more infrastructure to make sure that they are receiving um, help with this energy burden conversation. Um, Again, when we look back to the clean energy plan, this is sort of how we're scoping it out. First of all, we'll use less energy. Second, we will generate more clean energy. And third, we'll probably buy some recs. But we'll see what we can do um, in number one and two first. Um, and we have a clean energy advisory board that we are convening right now. First meeting probably the beginning of the year. So we'll actually get some input again on how to come about that. Our largest project for 2020 is the American Cities Climate Challenge work. It's broken down into two main categories, some focused on transportation, some for focused on buildings and energy. Um, so we have, we need to optimize our benchmarking work, we'll assess a decarbonization effort for Atlanta, um, and then we'll work on a few different transportation infrastructure, ideas, TDM, others to help offset some of the, um, some of the energy that we use here in Atlanta. But again, um, this, we can see the whole plan at 100ATL.com. This is my contact information if you have questions. Our sustainability director, John Seidel, is here too. So um, if anybody has questions, we'll address those after. Uh, <clears throat> All right, I feel like Tim and Shelby are being, um, I don't know, you're not selling yourselves enough. Like, the SPLOS that passed in Athens is, as far as I can tell, like the largest SPLOS investment in clean energy that has ever happened ever in the state of Georgia. So like, that's really cool. And then the, um, uh, the Solar Atlanta program is, you know, they, they use something called SEPAs, Solar Energy Procurement Agreements, which is this, you know, we passed this law in Georgia to make it easier to put solar on roofs and like this cool way to finance solar. And then no one was using it. I think we had like one SEPA two years ago in Macon. Um, and then all of a sudden, the city of Atlanta has 20. So it's like, I, I think there are, are really cool tools that are being put into play in a city that like, you should take credit for. Okay, um, questions? I have questions if no one else does. <laughs> yes? Uh, I love to hear it because that is historic and there, there are other cities like Boulder and others So I think I think it really happened. It was kind of in tandem, like I said, through these community members deciding to do the work. So first off, with our SPLOST, um, I highly recommend this for all communities, we have uh, a lot of citizen engagement built into it. Uh, citizens and community groups are able to submit proposals, not just county government departments. Um, and then we have a citizen advisory committee that reviews those things and makes recommendations to the commission. So uh, we had these community members with 100% Athens working with elected officials, working with um, uh, commissioners elect like myself, working with staff like Andrew Saunders to come up with um, a proposal that really worked and made sense and we, that was solid. And so we had that part happening and then of course then we had the political part. And a lot of that happened because it was just the timing of this new commission coming in, this new mayor, uh, this mandate in place. I mean, we had a, a number of incumbents taken out during this during this race um, that even the commissioners who were still in place, who hadn't been up for re-election, I mean, you know, they could, they saw how the wind had changed. There was, this was going to be, there was going to be consensus on this. And it was just matter, it just came down to how much are we going to invest. There was definitely some commissioners who wanted to pull it back to about $5 million. About 15, 16 was too much. 
Um, but I mean, to me, I was just hitting them all. I was like, look at that operating cost. You guys are all freaked out about this operating cost. Like, look at this. It's the, the savings is there too. Um, and it became uh, politically, it was the right time. And, um, and then we just had, the, the plan was in place. It was there. Um, and so now, I mean, we're able to have the funds to transition our, our, our transit fleet to an all electric fleet here coming soon, to have solar on every single municipal building going forward, um, to actually come up with plans so that we can allow um, our, our affordable housing uh, developments there to be uh, truly energy efficient moving forward. Um, so I mean, it, it is, it, it's, it's a big goal and I, I was really as proud of the SPLOSS in general. We used it in ways that had never been thought of before. We also have $45 million that's set aside for affordable housing. Um, so really, like, again, taking on the equity issue um, and, um, and also the sustainability issue because they are really are unique to one, they're combined one and the same. Um, and then thank goodness uh, the rest of the, the constituents agreed with us and passed it. So yeah. There are estimates. I'm not prepared to say what they are yet. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, in the back. Um, on the question of numbers, uh, what can you share with us about the situation of both the different uh, initial and uh, visual repairs that are being done and they're not being prioritized for electric only? Can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, and then what can you share from the visual I don't know how it'll be structured yet because yes, it is a tier three option. Um, and I think right now we're just exploring all those options and that's why the Clean Energy Advisory Board will be pulled together to help sort of assess um, those various mechanisms that exist out there. Cause I agree, there are a lot of options. There are a lot of ways to go about it. Um, you know, there are a lot of departments within city government that we'll have to coordinate with specifically through the procurement process through the city of Atlanta. So. Um, our office will just try to convene those conversations and I would expect that you'll hear more from us when we're at the point of making the decision and we know how many we have to try to buy. Yeah, agreed. I think the Athens resolution that passed actually specifically says by 2050, not only will we be 100%, but 80% uh, of that will be from very local projects. So I, you know, maybe we borrowed it from DC. I, I think they, in the, I thought I it was 60 said. maybe, but basically what, by 2050, I think it's supposed to be that we are not relying on the credits any more than 40% by, by, by 2050, I think. That, that was that language could have changed at the very end. Then. <laughs> yes. Going through the process to get a resolution passed and/or to develop an action plan, how how hard was it to do that and get the need to get outside financial help on the street grants? Um. So we, we, we have uh, some of the funding set aside so that we can use for grants. At this point, it's not, but that was definitely one of the, um, some of the bait that was put on the hook for some of the other elected officials to go along with it. Um, like the SPLOS language specifically says that this money can be used for matching funds for grants going forward. Uh, the, the actual resolution in place, um, I think it was just making sure all parties were on board and working together with this. I mean, uh, Andrew Saunders, our sustainability officer, was on board, uh, completely engaged with, again, the residents who were working on, on the resolution, with commissioners sitting down to make sure it was something that um, everybody that was palpable for all of the commissioners to, to pass it. Um, didn't really require much funding, just more of a political resolve to actually do it. 
We had a lot of partners helping with the outreach campaigns um, through different sort of stakeholder groups to try to make sure that it wasn't just a city-led initiative, but that it was community supported as well. Um, there was some grant funding to support that community work, but um, I think John R. might know a little bit more if you want to talk to him after about where that came from and how it filtered through. And, and I will say we did get uh, support from like other like regional and state, like Environment Georgia, uh, the Sierra Club stepping up, who had already worked with other cities like Atlanta to get this done and could kind of show us like, you know, the, the path to move forward and some of the mistakes to avoid. So. I have heard that there are um, some assessment plans in place for the purchase of electric buses. Um, I don't know for sure where that stands right now, so I can find out probably. That's all. Yeah, um, so we do have one of those amazing, valuable partners that we've had analyze a lot of our grid sourcing um, metrics is GreenLink Group. I'm sure many here are familiar with their modeling capacity, and what they do is try to balance out what is possible so the grid does not collapse. So we have that technical expert who can come in and give the testimony when that question is asked so that we don't do something that's going to destabilize anything. Um, and I will say that also goes into the rate case conversation and just establishing something that makes the most sense um, for most people. But I'll stop. Great questions. Uh, no, absolutely. Part of I, I viewed part of my job. I was on the um, city council before for eight years before uh, running for mayor. Um, part of my job, I felt like, was helping to communicate with the folks who elect us, who put us there, that we we're you know working for um, some of the complexities and just understanding what the basis of the conversation even was, because um, it can be pretty obscure. Uh, so I had a lot of conversations with my neighbors, or you know, I, I call everyone who lives in Oxford neighbors. We have about 2,000 or so people, a thousand of whom are students uh, at Oxford College of Virginia University. So um, having a lot of a lot of one-on-one -on -one and group conversations, and also just having being willing to have the conversations in public forums. Also, about we have a work session um, every month, and then we have our sort of formal meeting. So in those work sessions, things are a lot less formal and we could allow folks to ask questions. Um, but yeah, I, I sort of glossed over, there were some, there was some grassroots organizing that went along with it, get, you know, talking with folks um, about the issue and a lot of pressure from folks in our town uh, that wanted to see a change in the policy. So that was, that was definitely part of, a part of that. And as far as the, the pushback, um, try to be diplomatic. Um, there was pushback. Uh, uh, I mean, ECG is a technical, Electric Cities of Georgia is like the technical assistance arm of MEAG Power, and th they, they provide a service to their member cities, and so they were providing advice to the city 
um, on what the rate structure should be and why there should be the standby capacity charge. But on the other hand, you know, I was told uh, uh, sort of offline that, um, you know, MEAG was a little over purchased on production, uh, electric energy production. And so they weren't real excited about the idea of some other cities um, buying less or needing less power. Um, and so, you know, they, they were on a full on campaign going around to all their cities, getting them to adopt these um, new standby charges. Um, so, you, you know, I, 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 we definitely experienced a lot of pushback and I had to have uh, quite blunt conversations with, in public forums with folks from ECG. Um, yeah, I'll leave so it at that. What would be the, the Natchez or the restaurant that kind of convinced your colleagues um, that you could do this, given what they were hearing from ECG and yeah. I think it helped getting a lot of letters and emails and phone calls from folks in town. Uh, that helps, it always helps, um, giving some, some support. But really pulling out the numbers and demystifying some of it and um, showing you know, we're in such a strong financial position that we could afford to lose some revenue. Um, and, uh, and just you know, pointing out that we're, we're spending an inordinate amount of time arguing about something that's going to be relatively inconsequential uh, to us financially. The first part of your question, you mean advocating to other municipalities or do you mean internally within the community? I didn't quite. Well, I mean, between municipalities, <coughs> so it, rather than reinventing the wheel, learning from uh, those neighboring cities and trying to take it out. Yeah. I mean, certainly from Savannah's standpoint, I think we are all connected. Well, Georgia, I mean, we are all connected and we're all talking to each other quite regularly. Um, various colleagues we all have across the board and I that is a constant conversation so it's I mean we do it regionally as well outside of state boundaries but that's obviously not as much typically around the electric grid and and power supply but uh, talking about any climate or resilience topic I'm talking to Charleston and Miami and you know St. Mary's and whatever all the way through uh, but specifically on the power side I would say Jeanette mentioned it earlier, I mean, the more we can start to aggregate our ability as municipalities to have a larger, broader influence over state policy, also over just sharing those best practices with other communities, which is, I think, is a core part of why we're even here right now. Uh, just making sure that people see that it, it is possible, it can be a conversation, like I said, a year ago, I did not think I would even be having this conversation um, for maybe another five to six years. So things are flipping quickly, but I think it's, this is the avenue and one of the avenues where it's just trying to make sure people understand where the tipping points are, where the groundswell is coming from, and that uh, you're not alone in it and that there are some best practices to share, but we're also all learning it together. So um, I think it's just that regular communication that's most key. I mean, if with with elected officials, I think yeah, it's it's similar. I mean, we a lot of us talk, we go to conferences, we're talking and look, looking at things, and everybody's looking for solutions to a lot of the same issues that we all struggle with. Um, and it's, um, I mean, I know myself, like I'm I'm looking on to see like yeah, what what did they do in Atlanta? How did that work? You know, like like what's going on in Savannah? I'm like checking in, trying to follow those things, and I I know people are doing that in other communities too. Um, just finding out who's pushing the envelope a little bit and figured out something that really worked. Um, and uh, that's why I'm like so excited about the, the SPOS part because the funding is one of the most difficult things to come about. Um, and really finding that and, and, and pulling it off, at least to this point, you know, of having that funding secured um, 
so, you know, I was at an association of county commissioners of Georgia uh, meeting last month, and we were talking about what we were doing with SWAST, and people just had tons of questions of like, how did you do that? What's the language look like? You know, uh, what's the amount? Um, and so I, my hope is, is that we'll see a number of uh, counties and municipalities start, start copying what, what we're doing up here. I mean, yeah. All right, I'm getting the wrap up eyeball. Um, so I'm, I, I think y'all will probably be able to stay around for like the next couple minutes um, to answer questions that are still out there. Thank you all for being here. Um, hopefully people are feeling a little energized um, and ready to take on some problems. Thank you all.